Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ann Campbell, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Corning Museum of Glass. I'm excited to be hosting this week's episode of Connected by Glass, a virtual program we launched during our temporary closure. And I'm especially delighted to report that the museum has just completed its first full week of being open to the public. We closed our doors on March 16th due to COVID-19. That's a long time for us all to be away from the museum and the objects we love. Now that we're able to return, I'm excited to get back and be inspired by my favorite works all over again. I know our panelists are, and I hope all of you at home are, are, are um, expecting to see those works as well. Today, we're going to chat with a few members of the museum staff who will share their stories about what got them interested in their fields and what ultimately led them to glass. Their varied backgrounds and perspectives help them interact with our collection in different ways, and we'll learn about a particular object or objects that they each connect with. It's my pleasure to introduce our panel, Kate Larson, Curator of Ancient Glass, Marv Bolt, Curator of Science and Technology, Astrid Van Giffen, Associate Conservator, and Eric Goldschmidt, Flameworking and Properties of Glass Supervisor. As we get started, viewers, please remember that you can ask your questions in the live chat box at any time to get them in the queue, and our speakers will respond to them at the end. Kate, let's start with you. You have a background in archaeology. What got you interested in that field? and what ultimately led to museum work. Are we experiencing a little sound issue for Kate? Are you muted? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right, I'll try again. Um, so uh, I was, uh, I attended a college, uh, McAllister College in Minnesota that had an archaeology program, even though I didn't go to college intending to study archaeology. Um, I would always been interested in people in the past, especially the distant past. You know, I read National Geographic, I went to a lot of museums growing up, but I never thought about it as a career or something I could really do with my life. Um, and, you know, like all college kids, I was browsing the course catalog one day in my sophomore year and thought, hmm, introduction to archaeology, that sounds like, like fun. Uh, so I took the class and I was totally hooked. Um, there, um, I like to say there's a lot of ways to do archaeology and be an archaeologist. And I got my start um, doing that through fieldwork and excavation. So my college professor at the time uh, ran an excavation um, of a Roman period temple site in Northern Israel. So I was really fortunate to get to go on that project um, for a few summers. Archaeology fieldwork isn't for everyone. It's really long days, hot sun. I could tell you terrible stories about, about bugs and I've never been dirtier in my life than when I've done archaeology. Um, and it's a lot of manual labor, but it was really exciting to wake up every morning and not know what you were going to find. And I really liked the trying to put together the pieces and figure out what had happened at the site, who was there, what they were doing, what they were thinking, why they were there. Um, and archaeology is really a science, uh, but it has human activity at its core, and that really appealed to me. And what led you to glass? So I started studying glass in graduate school. Uh, as I mentioned, excavation is one way to do archaeology, but an excavation is really kind of finding the things. Um, but studying those things that you find is another that's probably even more important. So I kind of transitioned from that field work into studying finds. So my graduate school advisor uh, specialized in pottery, and she had some glass beads from the site um, that she was working on that somebody needed to look at and do some research on. And it felt like a good match because in high school, uh, my cousin, who happened to be a glass blower, taught me how to make some glass beads at a flame, very similar to what people at the museum do and make your own glass. Um, pretty straightforward bead working. Um, so I felt that I had some insight into the material and how it worked, and I could bring that knowledge to the study of these 2000 year old objects. And it became a way of really bringing things together that I loved. And it's really one of the things I love about working at the Corning Museum of Glass, too, is 
how we can bring together people who come at glass from all these different perspectives and we all learn from each other. So I've learned so much about age of glass from people like Eric, uh, who's on this program. With us. Quite a fascinating background. Now we'll turn our attention to Marv. You're our curator of science and technology, and you have a particular passion for telescopes. What is it about them that fascinates you? I think the, the big reason is that telescopes are time machines. So they allow you to see objects that are so far away that it takes like thousands or even millions of years for the light to travel to our eyes. So with telescopes, we get to see stars and galaxies, not as they are right now, but as they were thousands or millions of years ago. I think that's absolutely mind boggling. And that's what attracted me to uh, study telescopes. So for the past 25 years or so, I've been looking for the world's oldest telescopes. The one on the screen is the very oldest dated example made by the year 1617 at the latest. And perhaps surprisingly, its home today is a decorative arts museum, the Kunstgewerbemuseum in Berlin. But at the Corning Museum of Glass, of course, we can point to our own iconic telescope. It's the 200 inch mirror disc made for the Mount Palomar Observatory near San Diego. This first attempt uh, failed when the mold broke, but the second effort was successful and became a key part of the world's largest telescope. And in the photo just above my head there, you can see uh, where the mold came apart and the glass clumped together instead of making the pattern of triangles and hexagons that you see in the rest of that disc. Now here we're looking at the back of the disc and we can see two different color schemes. There's a yellow orangey combination of light that's passing through the disc and there's blue light reflecting off the disc. And in the next slide, you can see that blue color even more prominently. And that blue light is reflecting off the, the disc. And then in the following slide, um, we can see both color schemes uh, again. So in that, uh, on that other side, this side here, the, the front side, that's the substrate for a mirror. It would have had a reflective layer of aluminum deposited on this front surface. So after light from the distant universe hits the mirror, it bounces off another mirror and then passes through that central hole there. So it's like your eye and that's the pupil. And there a glass plate or camera would capture that light. That disc itself here is made out of a special borosilicate glass. It's, um, it's like Pyrex. And the boron ions give it a stability when temperatures change, which happens on mountains, right? During the day or uh, night, the, the temperature changes are, are dramatic. Unfortunately, when the glass was being melted for this disc, it phase separated into a boron rich phase and a silica rich phase, which means that you have two different kinds of glass that are intermingled here. And this mixture interacts with light in interesting ways, creating that dichroic effect of yellow orange scattered light and blue reflected light. Now that's a long way of saying, I think it's a beautiful iconic scientific object and the, the glass properties are fascinating and you can actually see physically what those microscopic glass properties are. So I think the stories behind telescopes make them very interesting and that's why I'm fascinated by them and why I study them. So exciting and iconic indeed. This work um, is part of virtually every visit to the museum and um, this um, 200 inch disc has, has inspired so many of us and I know I in my earliest memories can remember visiting the museum and seeing this object so it's actually super. Astrid, you are a conservator and you and your team care for nearly 50,000 objects in the museum's collection. What got you interested in this line of work? And don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Almost forgot. <laughs> yeah, so I um, learned about conservation in an art history class in college. And then um, a little bit later, I was able to do um, volunteer at an excavation where I spent a lot of time washing shirts and it was really, really fun. <laughs> So it might sound boring to some people, but what I really love about conservation is kind of this mixture between art, science, and the practical hand skills. And that really, really appeals to me. So I did my um, conservation training in Amsterdam in a program specifically 
study glass and ceramics conservation um, and ended up doing an internship here uh, back in 2006 as part of that training. Um, and it just the glass just kind of grabbed me. And I think it's one of the more challenging materials um, to conserve uh, because it's transparent. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a good challenge and I love a challenge. That's great. And now we're going to switch gears and talk with Eric Goldschmidt, the museum's flameworking and properties of glass supervisor. Eric, you've been working flameworking um, for more than 20 years, but glass wasn't the first museum material that piqued your interest. You worked first worked with wax to make candles, correct? What led you to glass? Yeah, that's right. I, I did start uh, my career in crafting as a candle maker, uh, building up a, a wholesale candle company with a couple of friends. Uh, we had, uh, most of our designs were very colorful, sort of kaleidoscopes of, of color, and they were all hand poured. And uh, after a, a few years of candle making, I had a friend move in with me as a roommate who had a couple years experience flame working. He set up a little studio in our garage at home, and I was just immediately fascinated with what he was up to. I, I saw a material that seemed to have a lot more potential to it, and I also just really fell in love with the process of flame working and, and the possibilities of that process. And uh, oddly enough, before I started to dive in and do some flame working myself, I was in the midst of developing a, a candle design that involved dipping a, uh, a white candle in several different layers of colored wax and then carving through those different colors with a torch. So I sort of had this preface to that, that next phase in, uh, in my crafting career. And after uh, about a year and a half of flame working with my friend John and him sort of getting me off to a, a good start, I started coming out to Corning to take classes here at the museum. And uh, the picture that we're showing the audience is uh, a shot of myself as a teaching assistant for Cesare Toffolo in a class at our studio here at the museum in 2001 and uh, Cesare has been a huge influence on my work. I, I have really fallen in love with glass through the years and Cesare comes from a, a hundreds year old family tradition from the island of Murano and Venice and he really made a, a huge impression on me as to that, that long-standing culture of glass that has supported that island for centuries and really helped me to, to sort of understand where I could potentially go with the material. So uh, the studio really opened my eyes. I had the opportunity to study with all sorts of different experts there. And uh, I, I can't believe it's, it's actually been 24 years of glass making. And it's such a thrill to be able to share what I have a passion for every day here at the museum uh, through our flame working demonstrations. So I'd say the path has worked out pretty well for me. Amazing. And again, I have to just say how um, amazing it is to hear about everyone's varied backgrounds. So fascinating. What brought you to our amazing institution um, are these just incredible um, deep narratives. So it's just I'm always um, amazed every day by the depth of knowledge that is shared by the staff at the Corning Museum of Glass um, and your backgrounds are a testament to that. And now that we know a bit about your backgrounds and perspectives that you bring to glass, let's talk some about our collection. Kate, is there a particular object in the collection that speaks to you on a personal level? How does it make you feel to work with some of the finest examples of ancient glass anywhere in the world? So, Anne, I, I love this question because it's so many people often ask, like, what's your favorite object? But personal object is like, it's a, I think it's a more interesting, it's a more fun question. Um, so I had to think about this for a while uh, and I came down on um, an object called the Kofi Pendant. Uh, the Kofi Pendant was the first major acquisition that I made for the museum when I was named uh, curator of ancient glass here. Um, and there's a great story behind it. So it was found on a beach in England after a storm by a beachcomber uh, in the early 1990s. And that's uh, the name of the village is that he found it nearby was where it gets its name. So it was found near the village of Kohai. Um, and the person who found it registered it with the Portable Antiquities Scheme in the UK. 
um, where it was evaluated by experts and published and kind of in accordance with all the appropriate antiquities laws in the UK. And we had the opportunity to uh, acquire it in 2017 with all the proper documentation behind it. Um, and one of the things that made it really exciting um, as an addition to our collection is because we don't have much jewelry or any really any material at all um, from this period, which is uh, after the um, Roman occupation of England uh, and then a few centuries later, it's a period called the Anglo-Saxon period in England. Um, and it's a great glassy object. Uh, you can see from the photo that it's got these twisted canes in it, which is an old glass making technique goes back more than 2000 years. And you'll see um, used in Renaissance Venetian glass and even by a lot of modern glass makers today. That's what those uh, blue and white kind of spirally looking things are. They're laid canes on the piece. But what makes this object really personal to me um, is that when I saw it in person, we're so we're so used to looking at things on screens, especially these days, um, and looking at photos, but seeing an object in person is really a different thing. And so when I got to see this object in person, and I think we've got a photo of this, um, is that I saw um, the on the suspension loop of the pendant, what you're looking at on the right here, um, there are these two little divots on the pendant where it hung from a chain or a cord. Um, and I immediately recognized that as a mark that I have on a pendant that I myself had worn for years and years and years. And that's what's on the left of the screen here is this pendant. And you'll immediately right away see like it has those same two divots. And I played with my pendant all the time. I pulled on it. I yanked on it. I, you know, it was kind of a fidgety thing. And I felt this connection to this person who had worn this pendant more than a thousand years ago um, as soon as I saw it. Archaeologists have a fancy name for this. It's called wear marks. Um, but it shows us that this piece was made and used and worn and somebody fidgeted with this pendant just the way I fidgeted with my pendant. And again, it's one of those things I really love about uh, studying the past is this opportunity to connect with people who lived so long ago and whose lives were different from ours in ways that we can't even begin to imagine sometimes. But we find these moments of human connection and realize how similar and human some of these behaviors are. And so if you visit the museum, you can look for this piece in our in the Roman section of our 35 centuries gallery and hopefully see see those little wear marks for yourself. What a great story. I have to say that gave me goosebumps. It, it, <laughs> was, it was wonderful. Um, and now Marv, people know they'll encounter great art when they visit the Corning Museum of Glass, but they're often surprised to learn that we are also a science museum. Is there a particular object that draws on your passion for telescopes? Why, yes, there is. In fact, more than one. And in fact, I was tempted to pick uh, this work by Mark Pizer, who's a brilliant glass artist. And uh, one time he was commenting on this piece and he said, the 200 inch disc was intended to reflect light, but instead it's captured the light. And that was one of those goosebump moments too. I thought, wow, he's a good artist, but he's a pretty good poet too. Um, but I'm going to cheat and I'm actually going to pick a different object. Um, and that's a work commissioned for the museum made by Dominic Labino. And you'll see that in the in the next slide. Labino invented the, the small glass furnace that made it possible for artists to design and also make their own glass in their own studio. And that launched the, the studio glass movement. So in his guidebook for glass artists, this very one here that I'll sort of move around. Um, he says, color is the key to glass art. And one commentator says that for Labino, color dictates form, right? Color dictates form. So in that work on the right, we see how that actually plays out. The piece is called Ionic Structure of Glass. And in the very middle of that piece, you'll actually see a representation of silicon, oxygen, sodium, and calcium. Chemically, it's the ionic structure of glass. So when you're looking at this, it's really a look through a microscope at the ionic structure of glass. So side by side, we actually on the left have a telescope to observe the largest structures of the universe, and on the right, a microscope to observe the smallest. And the parallels, I think, are quite interesting. So both of them obviously are round and they have a central hole where observing takes place. And then what's observed is captured on a glass plate in the middle. 
Now, if you look carefully on the left, if you think of these pieces as a clock face, you'll see they both have cracks or breaks at 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. And both have the same yellow, orange, and blue colors marked by triangles and hexagons. In other words, the ionic structure of glass is sort of a copy of the 200 inch disc. And if we go at a deeper level or a meta level, it's the ionic structure of the borate glass that creates the colors of the disc that create the colors of the ionic structure of glass to depict the ionic structure of glass. So there's a really, really nice connection between those, but there's more. So in the next slide, uh, we'll see another work by Labino called Emergence. And Labino represented the growth of something like a life form emerging from a seed, or maybe it's an atom blowing up or something like that. In the end, something small is blooming into something large. And the colors of this actually stem from the first color astronomical photograph ever taken, which we'll see in the next slide. All right, so here we see the Orion Nebula, and that contains clouds of dust that each condense into a star. You didn't know you were getting an astronomy lesson here, did you? So these clouds condense into a star, and then the star shines and it blows away the remaining dust. The effect is very much like the emergence piece. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see the connection there. So these two are the same phenomenon. One's on an astronomical scale, one's on a microscopic scale, just like the 200 inch disc and the ionic structure of glass. And as for that first color astronomical photograph, well, it was taken with the 200 inch disc at Mount Palomar. So we'll go to the next slide. In all of these examples, um, the Lobino examples, the 200 inch disc, what we're really seeing is science and art coming together and commingling in, in really beautiful ways. And that's just like the different glasses that are commingling to create something spectacular. And that coming together of science and art is one of those amazing features of the Corner Museum of Glass and why it's so amazing to work there, but also to visit. So when somebody comes, uh, they're not side by side on display. You're gonna have to sort of take a mental photograph and go between them. But I'd encourage you to do that and see for yourself to see if this is a, a convincing comparison or not. Wow, Marv, that was just um, some amazing parallels that you drew from those objects. And I, I feel like I just got a great lesson myself. So thank you for that. Um, and now turning to Astrid, you have worked with Blaschka materials for many years, including the glass flowers, even before you came to the museum. Then you had a chance to restore many of the Blaschka marine invertebra invertebrates for a 2016 exhibit here. What's the significance to you of this collection for you personally? I was muted okay. again. <laughs> uh, these, these are such fun objects. They're incredibly delicate, incredibly intricate. Um, and you know, th there seems to be kind of a theme of science and, and art together, and these really embody that as well. Um, you know, they represent really accurate um, models of real animals. Um, and they're just, they're fascinating to look at. There's so much variety, both in terms of the animals they represent, the um, materials that were used, the techniques that were used, as well as their conservation challenges. And it's been really fun to um, work on them over the years. And you know, I've had the chance to look at one of the first collections, which is now at the uh, National Museum of Scotland, and one of the last ones that the Blaschkas made, which is um, at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And just to see how those techniques and the materials have changed over time has been really, really fun. Um, like I said, the challenge of working on these is, is really fun too. One of, if we can go to the next slide, um, this is just one of the uh, example of how difficult they can be to work on. So the glass is extremely thin um, and some of the broken 
parts are really, really hard to reach. So we really had to come up with kind of innovative ways to to do that. And in this slide, um, I'm trying to um, reattach this tiny fragment of glass inside of the squid's head. Um, and in order to do that, I had to glue it onto a bamboo skewer first. So that's just one example of these kind of challenges um, that I've come across working on them. And there's a lot of discovery with these too. So, you know, each each treatment starts with a very detailed examination. Um, and one of the things I'm especially interested is in trying to figure out how how um, the objects were made. So we actually know very little about um, how the Blaschkas made their models. There's very little written about it. They didn't, they were pretty secretive about it. So much of what we know about it comes from actually looking at the objects. And so there's always this sense of discovery um, that is accompanied by looking at them. If we can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on um, last summer, we kind of rehoused most of our um, Blaschka collection. And some of the, the, the things that we came across were these boxes with all these broken bits, parts that have been separated. Uh, you can see on the image on the left, there's you know these boxes with all these bits and they have no real identifying information uh, with them. But because I've spent so much time looking at models, there are kind of examples where I can figure out, okay, well, this is part of a jellyfish. This is part of um, an anemone. So it helped me kind of identify uh, what these pieces belong to. And the image on the right is another uh, example where, so the this is one of these large anemones. There's, we have several of them where the, outside top part has become separated from base and kind of this inside part of the body. Um, and these were separated. They were not connected. Um, we, did, we, In fact, they have been accessioned as separate objects because that connection had been lost over the years. But by looking at how the, um, the glass broke and kind of traces of color on what remains on the base, I was able to kind of re um, reunite these two pieces. Um, and there's several other examples like that. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, there's another kind of one of these aha moments. So this, um, the, the tiny little jellyfish that you see on the left was in one of these boxes. It had been completely kind of separated from its original object. But when I saw it, I immediately recognized the painting um, on kind of the edge and realized that it was the same species as an object that I worked on for the ex exhibition in 2016, which you see on the left. So th that was one moment where, you know, I can, can put these objects together and kind of um, figure out where this little loose floating bit belongs. Um, if we can go to the next slide, we can see what the model it goes to looks like now. So um, this the image on the, the um, left is what the, the model looks like. And then you can see it's very badly damaged. Much of it is missing. Um, we now have one part that was on there um, that the little jellyfish can be re reunited with it. But we also have in the, um, the library, we have the Blaschka's drawings that they did kind of in preparation for making these models. And it shows that, you know, it shows what parts I need to look for for um, the rest of this model. And we haven't found it yet, but I'm hoping that we will soon. Wow, what a remarkably um, painstaking work that must be, and yet so satisfying when you do have that aha moment. It's just incredible. Um, and anyone who has seen any of the, the Blaschka work on um, view at the museum, it is just stunning in its detail, especially given the size and the time period in which they were made. It just, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, so thank you, Astrid. And now we turn to Eric. Um, as with furnace work, there is a long lineage of flame workers before you who paved the way for the work you create today. You have a particular interest in learning about the history of your field. Is there an historical object that you're inspired by or something that influences your personal work? 
Yeah, so I, I do sort of obsess over the, the history of flame working, and there are a number of flame worked objects in our collections here at the museum that certainly inspire me and, and excite me. And I, uh, I do have quite a passion to continue to understand more of what came before myself and uh, my, my contemporary colleagues. But to be perfectly honest, the, the pieces that probably have had the biggest influence on my personal artwork are not flame worked objects. Uh, I have been making a series of cage cups for, I guess, so over a decade now that really are inspired by an ancient cage cup that we have in our collections. And uh, cage cups were items of extreme luxury and very rare. And uh, they were made uh, around the fourth century by Roman glassmakers. Uh, the original ones were actually furnace blown thick cups that were then carved away through cold working processes to create the cage that you see suspended off of the cup. So uh, a very different process from flame working where I'm doing more of an additive process. So for my flame worked uh, cage cups, I blow the form and then I attach pieces of rod to sort of assemble a cage on the outside of a cup. And uh, so they become very different objects. And now we, we see some of my cage cups. Uh, the one on the right, uh, when I first started making these, they were fairly simple, more intended to be decorative objects. Uh, some of them sort of reflected uh, energy I might feel from different situations. Uh, the piece we see on the right of the screen here, I call autumn evening cage cup. But uh, another thing that influenced and, and sort of permeated into my work through an experience here at the museum, uh, about maybe seven years ago, I was handed a stack of very thin sheet glass and asked if I could try experimenting with it, see if I could shape it on the torch and see, see how manageable it was to, to try to shape very thin sheet glass. And I tend to lean towards a lot of figurative themes in my work also beyond just the, the goblet things. So my hands sort of naturally started shaping this little sheet glass into a face and eventually sculpting those bits of sheet glass. Uh, I have found sheet glass that was compatible with the glass that I typically work with for my sculptural work, which is borosilicate. And uh, I started to shape some of that over the flame and really sort of invented a, a new process of sculpting sheet glass to add some details into the cage cups. And the, the cups sort of morphed going from a decorative object into something that, that was a bit more conceptual. So what was once a, a really rare luxury object in Roman times, for me, became sort of a metaphor. The, the cage became a metaphor for sort of personal traps that we fall into or traps that society might uh, sort of trap us in. And some of them will present solutions for getting out of those traps or, or sort of reference the effect those traps may have on us. And uh, so that is the, the sort of faces that you see on the goblet on the left. So those are sculpted bits of sheet glass. So even though I do have this obsession for flame working and for flame worked objects, you just never know where these uh, these different influences might come from. And that really is uh, another one of the beautiful things of working here at the museum. I, I gain influences from our collections. I gain influences from my coworkers and colleagues around here. And uh, there, there really is just no end to the inspiration. It's it's all a matter of sort of capturing those those glimpses that, that really affect you and, and then where you can take them uh, with your own energy from there. So. Yeah, the, the collections and my experiences here have had a, a great effect on the, the work that I produce. Eric, thank you so much for sharing some of your amazing artistry with us. Um, it's just uh, incredible to consider the inspiration that our collections bring to artists like you, but also researchers and, and um, people across so many fields. So it, it's wonderful. Um, and thank you all for sharing those personal stories of, of your connections to our collections. Um, now we're going to um, 
turn to kind of some fresh perspective. We've all been away from our objects, our collection for three months, and several of us have just started returning to the museum. Some of you may have just taken your first stroll around the galleries. Um, it's possible you haven't been back, but I'm wondering, um, Kate, um, did the time away help you see um, the work with fresh eyes? You know, uh, it it really did. Um, a few things have happened in our world in the last three months or so. Um, and so when I got into the galleries about a week or so ago, um, I was especially, I found myself drawn to a case um, that has a group of pendants that depict uh, human, uh, several human and animal faces. Um, everyone's going to think I have a pendant obsession after this <laughs> session. Maybe, maybe I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, so these particular pendants um, were made in the middle of the first millennium BCE, so about 2,500 years ago. You're seeing a few of them here. Um, and similar examples to the ones in our collection have been found on three different continents, on Europe, in Africa, in Asia, um, all over the Mediterranean, and even up into the Black Sea. And we generally associate them with the seafaring people called the Phoenicians, who originated in the area of modern Lebanon and established trading colonies all over the Mediterranean. So these pendants, as you can see, even from these three examples, come in all manners of appearance, men, women, different colors and of skin, hair, different hairstyles, jewelry, some with features like dots on their foreheads. Uh, unfortunately, one of the problems with archaeology and ancient history is we usually have more questions than answers. So I can't really say why these pendants were made or who made them or what they were for. Um, I have some ideas. I used to think that they were kind of a Phoenician way of making sense of a diversity of peoples they were encountering as they were traveling around, uh, trading, meeting different peoples and cultures. Um, maybe a way of kind of celebrating or embracing that diversity. Um, or maybe it's a little bit more nefarious. And these are examples of what we now consider racist depictions or think about in that way. Um, but I think that the reason they're speaking to me right now is that they remind me that the world has always been a complicated place and that people have had to find ways to coexist in it together. And things we take as givens like national borders or race or gender aren't natural um, and they they're created by people and by society and they change and evolve over time. Um, so there's a lot of contemporary society that I see reflected in these 2,500 year old faces. Yeah, amazing. Eric, what about you? Any fresh perspective now you, you've returned to the museum? Uh, yeah, well, I, I was excited just to get back here. I, I love working for the museum. It's fabulous to be able to share what you have a passion for with uh, so many guests every year. And there are certain pieces that bring me inspiration or sort of relax me when I'm a little stressed out. I, I might go wander the collections and, and search out these pieces. So uh, if we can pop up our first slide here, this piece, Marie Antoinette sacrifices the heart of the nobility on the altar of the French Republic, uh, I think may be the most incredible example of uh, flameworking skill that we have in our collections as far as an older piece. Uh, this piece made in 1790 would have been made just on a, a small oil lamp with a bellows and uh, the the craftsmanship is out of this world and I uh, this is sort of one of my old friends in the collections when I feel a little stressed out I know I can go wander over to the case find this piece and just sort of relax with, with Marie Antoinette for a little bit. And uh, if we skip ahead, uh, another, another slide here. Uh, just as Astrid has a, a passion for the work of the Blaschkas, many of us flame workers do as well. Uh, the skill that they exhibited as flame workers in the, the second half of the 19th century and then into the, the early 20th century is just absolutely fascinating. And uh, again, they would have been working on uh, equipment similar to what Pierre Halley was working on back in 1790. So an oil lamp creating the flame and a bellows accelerating the flame. And uh, so much of their work is actually multimedia. So there are a number of us contemporary flame workers who we can make some of the forms that are involved in, in some of these objects 
but uh, very few of us actually have the skills and the, the breadth of media that the Blaschkas had skills in. So we're all still completely fascinated by how they may have made these pieces. They're, they're still quite mysterious to many of us. And as Astrid pointed out, sort of trying to decode some of those mysteries is, is an absolutely fascinating passion. So that was a, another object I just was really excited to get back to. And uh, it's, it's another object that when I just sort of need to, to get away from the, the, the other stresses that may present themselves through the day, th this piece helps quite a bit. So it's been great to get back and, and get back to see some old friends here. That's great. Astrid, were you in the middle of any projects that you're coming back to now with fresh eyes? Yeah, so as I was mentioning before, we rehoused um, our, our Blaschka collection last summer, and I was and am still in the middle of cleaning all of them. So uh, I think I have about 100 left to clean. Um, and then the next step will be, you know, trying to um, match all the, the loose bits with the models that they belong to. So here's kind of uh, my, my setup at the warehouse where I clean these. So I'm just doing very minimal cleaning. Um, with just with a dry brush and, and a vacuum just to get some of that dirt and grime off of there because that can actually um, damage the, the glass and the other materials on the wash goods. Marv, anything you'd like to add? Oh, sure. Um, while we're queuing up the, uh, the last slide I showed of the 200 inch disc and uh, the ionic structure of glass, I'll, I'll make two comments. One is, uh, we've been working on the installation of an exhibition on Corel, and it's one thing to see uh, in the abstract the drawings and such, but it's quite another to see them in person. And uh, I'll put in a shameless plug, it looks spectacular. Um, but I would, I would echo Kate in that the uh, experience of the past few months have really changed how we're looking at objects. And it's going to take a while to really uh, reorient ourselves to uh, all the stories of these objects. Um, for me, going through the galleries is like uh, going to a family reunion. There are some people and objects, you have to confess, you just don't remember ever seeing them before. Uh, what are they doing here? How did I miss them before? Um, and then there are others that are familiar. They're nice to see again. But for some reason, they aren't exactly how you remember them the last time you saw them. And uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, but going back to our, uh, our slide here, um, I think what came as a surprise to me, a pleasant surprise, was just the, the variations in the colors and the vibrancy of the colors and how these objects both look different under different lighting. The, the interaction of light and glass is, is just extraordinary in these objects. And as much as I've spent a lot of time uh, with both of them, every time I, I look at them, I see something new, something different. And I think that's uh, at the heart of what a museum visit is, is that it makes you see the world a little differently. And uh, as we rethink some of our exhibitions, uh, that's going to be uh, our goal as well. So uh, if you haven't been to the museum lately, you're, you'll certainly see things that you hadn't seen before. Um, happens every time I go through the galleries. So uh, I encourage everybody to have a closer look. Thank you, Marv. And what a great segue to our um, probably abbreviated um, Q&A session. We do have a number of questions in the live chat. Thank you to those who are watching who um, contributed some questions. Um, I'm going to start by um, asking one question for each of our moderators, and then we'll see what time we have left. Um, it may be that we just have time for four. Um, so I'm going to start with a question for Marv about the um, 200 inch disc and um, we have a question. How was the 200 inch disc annealed? So the answer to that is very slowly. <laughs> um, so one of the, uh, the, the challenges of that uh, huge disc was that nobody knew exactly how long it would take to do that. So they conducted an experiment really to 
have it in a in a large uh, oven that would slowly decrease its temperature by uh, by a degree or two every day, and then just have it take place over many months. But they wanted to test their annealing theory so that they actually sped it up and did it in an abbreviated time to see how much stress would be left afterwards and were their models correct. And it turned out that their models were correct. They could uh, measure the amount of stress that was still left in this disk so that when they recast it in the, in the second case, um, they knew how long they should take for it to anneal. So uh, it was uh, an unfortunate uh, accident that the, the mold broke, but it turned into both a lovely experiment and really an, an iconic uh, work that uh, graces our museum. And we're, we're so privileged to have this, this spectacular item on display. Agreed. Now, I love this question for Catherine. Do you have a favorite piece or a really fascinating piece that you have personally excavated? You know, I don't. <laughs> yeah, the, the reality is that most of the glass you find and excavate, we have these beautiful glass artworks in the museum collection, um, and most of what you find in excavations are just kind of people's everyday old garbage. Um, so the kind of things that you, you know, especially glass, right, that you drop on the ground and breaks and you throw away in the trash, like that tends to be what you find. So it's not very... Not very exciting. And I also have, um, there's kind of a joke in archaeology about, you know, luck on projects. And I happen to have, some people just find really amazing stuff and some people never find stuff at all. Um, so one excavation I was working on, for instance, um, found a, somebody found a gold coin or the, the project found a gold coin the day after I left the project. So, <laughs> you know, gold coins are pretty rare to find in excavation, right? Um, but I wasn't even there when the <laughs> thing got found. So I don't have a better story for that one. No, that's a very <laughs> real answer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Honesty, right? Exactly. Um, now, here is a question to Astrid from Kieran, age seven. What is your favorite piece of glass you have worked on? So, of course, I have to pick a Blaschka. Because, well, they're, they're fun. And actually, I think it, it is um, the squid that I uh, had up earlier. Um, he just had such a cute little face. We nicknamed him Squiddy. And he just like, you can kind of see it in the picture, but um, on the, the side that's down on this picture, um, he had a, a big crack that kind of stuck out and that just made, made him look like he had a big pouty lip. And um, so it just... The, the the model itself just had so much character and was so fun but then also the kind of the challenge of you know trying to glue these tiny little fragments of glass on the inside and having to come up with kind of new ways to do that um the the crack that is in there um we left but i kind of disguised it by putting um some paper behind it and then painting that so it's kind of the same color so it's still there, but it's not as disruptive. Um, and I had to, the, the whole inside, even the parts um, where there weren't any losses, there were a lot of cracks that I kind of had to create band-aids for again with, with paper. So it was just a really kind of fun um, piece to, to work on because I had to come up with so many new kind of solutions for the problems I saw. Well, and I think from I, um, that, exhibition was before my time at the museum, but I do remember this little squid. So I think he played um, very heavily in our marketing and promotional materials. Again, probably in part due to his personality, it just shows. This, this squid actually wasn't in that exhibition. Oh, um, it was, <laughs> we, we treated it for um, an exhibition up at um, Cornell's Johnson Museum. So they had um, an exhibition there shortly after we had ours here. Gotcha. All right, Eric, as an artist, do you ever draw inspiration from unexpected parts of the, the collection? Well, I, uh, I certainly draw inspiration from all parts of the, the collections here. 
And uh, I, I mentioned earlier some inspirations that I've drawn from my own personal work, but as far as inspiration for me as a person, I think one of the, the greatest pieces that I, I love to visit with is Anthem of Joy by Vera Lishkova. And uh, I, another thing I love to do in life, another passion I have is live music. And let's face it, in this time where we can't have live in-person music, uh, it has been pretty rough, but Lishkova made this amazing piece all with borosilicate glass, which is what I tend to work the most with. And it's her expression of how a, a musical score makes her feel. And I just have always loved that that feel of that object it, it sort of connects with me as a flame worker and it really connects with me uh having the, the passion for live music that i have so that that actually was another one of the pieces that i couldn't resist uh quickly visiting as soon as i got back here on campus so yeah that's a, a another huge inspiration for me in our collections here that's great well we are winding down our question time i might have Time for one last question. Let me see. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, why don't we throw this to Marv um, with a quick, for a quick answer to what's the most interesting telescope Marv has ever gotten his hands on? <laughs> wow, what a question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so where even to start? I think I think that one is probably. Uh, the candidate I would pick because it is the oldest surviving example. And um, I got a chance to disassemble it. And I'm pretty sure I'm probably the first person to have disassembled it in, in about 400 years because of uh, some of the grime buildup and, and just some of the condition of it. And to be able to, to take that apart and to, to analyze that, um, wow, what a privilege and also kind of heart stopping because you have this in your hand and you think there's no backup plan here um really really got to focus here don't don't have your mind start wandering which is always a challenge for me so uh, this one uh is, is truly spectacular and it, it it's part of a diplomatic exchange between uh well diplomats obviously and so it's it's not a scientific object. It's really part of a, a broader culture, cultural exchange. And it really says something about the intersection of art and science 400 years ago as well. So I could talk about this one for a long time, but I won't. Um, <laughs> but this one is certainly uh, a fascinating object uh, that I felt hugely privileged to, to have a look at and through. Amazing. And yes, I'm sure that it was equal parts terrifying and incredible <laughs> to have that in pieces. Um, but we've reached the end of our time together. So I'd like to thank our my colleagues, our panelists, and you at home for watching and asking questions today. This episode of Connected by Glass will be added to our YouTube channel along with six other episodes on a wide range of topics. If you are enjoying Connected by Glass, please consider supporting the museum so we can continue to bring you compelling content. We'll have another episode on Thursday, July 23rd at 1 p.m. Look for more details on our social media soon. And if you're inspired to come and see your favorite works in our collection in person, please head to our website and plan your visit. Take care, everyone.